is Sid Melcher. I'm executive director of the World Affairs Council. Our speaker today is Greg Fay, and he comes to us via Sheila McElwain, who brought him to our attention a bit ago uh, via her French group, many of whom I believe are here today. Um, and um, Greg is originally from Enfield. Uh, he's also brought some of his family with him today. Uh, he is the project manager of the Washington, D.C.-based Uyghur Human Rights Project. He has conducted research in the Uyghur Autonomous Region of the People's Republic of China in Northwest China on a Fulbright Fellowship. And after that, he worked in New York for China Labor Watch and then the Committee to Protect Journalists. He will speak to us today on human rights for the Uyghur ethnic group in China. Please join me in welcoming Greg Fay. All right, thank you all so much for coming today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, as Sid said, I'm Greg Fay, and I work in Washington, D.C. for the Uyghur Human Rights Project. And I also really want to want to thank Sheila, um, who is in my mom's uh, French conversation group, and uh, brought me here today. And in a, in a way, it's through my mom's French connection that I uh, first went to China and that I ended up studying this ethnic minority group from China, the Uyghurs. Um, I, after I, I went to high school in Enfield, Connecticut, and afterwards I went to Brown University. And after my freshman year of college, I really wanted to go abroad, pretty much anywhere, and there was funding for me to go to China, uh, teaching English that, that first trip. And that trip was so inspiring to me that I ended up majoring in East Asian studies in college. Um, and somewhere along the way, I studied this uh, ethnic minority group in China uh, called the Uyghurs. Um, and I'm saying that word a few times so you can really uh, get used to, to hearing it. It's a word that probably a lot of people haven't heard before. Um, and I will certainly tell you quite a bit today about the Uyghurs. Um, and in addition to, to studying Uyghurs, I've also, throughout my career, done a lot of work on human rights globally. And uh, first I was based in New York, now I'm based in Washington, uh, working for nonprofit organizations that try to protect human rights internationally. Um, so let's start by talking about who are the Uyghur people. Um, and let's see if I can advance this slide. Great. Um, here I have for you, and I know uh, Sheila really loves maps, so my presentation is pretty much just maps. Uh, this here is a map of uh, the People's Republic of China, what we, we call China, um, but it singles out certain regions of China that prior to, uh, prior to the founding of the modern Chinese nation after World War II, um, some parts of China were actually independent nations or historically not part of China. And the, the one that probably everyone knows is Tibet, uh, which you can see there bordering India, uh, the sort of south uh, southwest part of, of the Chinese map. So I'm sure most people have heard of, heard of Tibet, heard of the Tibetan struggle for independence, for human rights. Maybe you've heard Richard Gere talking about Tibetan people. Um, people know in this country about Tibet. Uh, often they don't know about the Uyghurs. And the Uyghurs are actually from the region north of Tibet. Um, and what the Uyghur people call their, their homeland is East Turkestan. Uh, why, why is it called East Turkestan? Because this is the easternmost part of the Turkic world. And uh, as, I'll, as, as I'll explain, the Uyghur people are a Muslim people um, and they're actually culturally oriented uh, westward um, towards uh, these other nations that you see bordering East Turkestan. East Turkestan, you see Kazakhstan there to the north, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, even Afghanistan and Pakistan. I mean, perhaps you didn't know all those countries border China, but they do, and it's all through East Turkestan, the Uyghur homeland. Um, also on this map, you'll see Inner Mongolia. I mean, uh, so the, these, these are all regions that now are um, ethnic regions in, in China, in the People's Republic of China. Um, this map uh, 
is very, uh, it's produced by activists because China itself doesn't like to acknowledge that these, uh, that these regions have any claim to independence are, you know, historically their own nations. Um, so let's actually, while we have this map up there, let's also talk about, you know, why, why is it so important to China for these, uh, for these territories to be considered part of the modern nation state? I mean, no country wants to give up territory, but just in terms of the, the strategic value um, of this Uyghur homeland, East Turkestan, um, as you can see in this map, it's a very large region. This is actually one sixth of the total area of China. So we're talking about a very large region of China. Um, and it's very important kind of geopolitically because it borders so many nations. And um, what, what, what you see on this map is that um, China has borders with, with many important countries. I mean, Mongolia, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. That's the, the, the Kashmir region of India too. So that's, you know, a lot going on on these, on these regions that border the Uyghur homeland. Um, and in addition, uh, this region is rich in mineral resources. There's a lot of gas, there's a lot of oil. Um, there's other uh, there's other resources that can be mined because um, the the region is full of mountains and deserts and so it has a, a tremendous value to uh, the government of China. So here now we have a map of the region itself. Um, so it's again it's a huge region. I think it's six times the size of California. Um, so we're talking a very large area. Um, but it's actually fairly sparsely populated. I mean, the, the whole population of China is like 1.4 billion. Uh, in this region, the population is only about 18 million. And the reason why it's so sparsely populated is because it's mostly mountains and deserts. Um, so you can see, uh, if you can see on this map, there's this huge desert here. It's called the Taklamakan Desert. And this is the second largest moving desert in the world. And this is kind of uh, this, this big desert there. And then the Jungar Basin to the north is not quite a de desert, but it's also a very dry steppe region. This is where uh, the Uyghur people have traditionally lived. So if we're thinking of the world prior to the, the modern Chinese nation prior to World War II, uh, Ninety percent of this region was Uyghur people, um, and mostly they lived in oases around the desert. So, uh, around this huge Taklamakan Desert are some of the biggest mountains in the world, a number of mountain chains, and uh, because some glaciers are melting and fresh water is flowing down from those mountains, they have formed oases that have supported. Uh, Uyghur civilization. So the Uyghur people are a desert people. Um, they've they've learned to farm and and to adapt to a desert lifestyle. Also, it means that <clears throat> their homeland is extremely ecologically fragile. Um, living in a desert isn't necessarily easy. And um, something I'll talk about a little bit today is that a lot of Chinese policies to develop the region have really been to the detriment of this. Uh, fragile ecology of um, of the desert region. Um, so that's that's some introduction to the to the Uyghur people. I said that prior to prior to the founding of the modern uh, People's Republic of China, this region was ninety percent Uyghur. Uh, since then, in order to consolidate the their power over the region, China has implemented a policy of migration to the region. And uh, the, the predominant ethnic group in China, the Han Chinese, have been moving to the region at great speed, particularly in the last two decades. Now the Uyghur people are about 40% of the population of the region. Um, and it's an interesting way that that migration has taken place because basically uh, most of, of that migrant population that's moved in of this other ethnic group, the Han, um, have moved into their own cities, um, kind of near around the same places where Uyghur cities traditionally have been. 
Um, but as a result um, of, this, of this massive migration, we were people are no longer the majority population in their homeland. Um, and part of this massive migration has been development, has been uh, big construction, major resource extraction projects, uh, huge agricultural initiatives, specifically uh, the two big industries are cotton and oil. And all the jobs in those industries actually also go to the Han Chinese migrants, not to the indigenous Uyghur people who have been there. So it's actually very hard for Uyghur people to get a job in their homeland, um, even if they have the same education level as, the, as these Han Chinese migrants. Um, and finally, I'm just going to tell you a little bit right now about the, the history of this region <clears throat> a little more broadly. I mean, so this. Again, you can see that it borders so many regions, and this is actually the heart of the Silk Road, um, this ancient pathway between West and East, where you know in, in the 13th century Marco Polo ventured from Europe to go serve the uh, serve the the Khan, the Mongolian Khan empires. Um, that was the the Uyghurs were kind of. Their, their homeland was the central part of that Silk Road. It's kind of smack in the middle between Europe and Asia. So a lot of important, uh, a lot of important religion, uh, religious hi history actually took place in the region. Um, the Buddhist religion actually came north from, from India through, uh, through this desert region into East Asia, into China. So the, the form of Buddhism that's practiced in China and Japan that was all historically actually Uyghur. I mean, it, it came through the Uyghurs. The Uyghurs were, at the time of that Mongolian empire of Genghis Khan and Kublai Khan, you know, the Mongols were uh, nomadic herders. The Uyghurs, on the other hand, they were settled, they, they had agriculture, and they had a written language. They were the scribes of the Mongol empire. So the, the ancient Mongolian language is actually Uyghur. Um, and around that time, it's about the, the 12th century, um, the Uyghur people converted en masse to Islam. So, so since, um, you know, about 700 years, uh, I mean, it, it gradually spread throughout that, that Uyghur area, especially because these oases are separate, uh, cultural evolution happened differently in different parts of the region. Um, but for, for many hundreds of years, uh, it, it has been a, a Muslim region. And that their practice of Muslim, the Uyghur people's practice of Muslim, is very informed by the, the Buddhism that predated uh, Islam in the region. And even before that, there was a, a form of Christianity that came to the region called Nestorian Christianity. Um, another religion called Zoroastrianism that's practiced in Persia. I mean, it all kind of went along the Silk Road and it all really influenced the Uyghur culture. Um, so, since 1949, since the, the People's Republic was established by Mao Zedong, um, the Uyghur people, the Tibetan people, the Mongolian people, everyone in this slide were promised <coughs> autonomy in the new nation that was being formed by Mao Zedong. So they pretty much agreed, OK, we'll be part of this new, this new nation. In 1955, they were actually incorporated as autonomous zones, or at least 1955 was the, the year that uh, the Uyghur region was incorporated as an autonomous zone. So the Chinese government promised all kinds of autonomy to the local people when they first came to power. Um, they promised freedom of religion. Uh, freedom to continue speaking their own language, um, freedom of speech, all kinds of freedoms. That was all on the table. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is kind of the ways that the Chinese Communist Party turned its back on those promises. And I mean, certainly you've probably heard about uh, the way China treats its citizens generally. I mean, a lack of free speech, a lack of free freedom of religion. All of those, uh, all of that repression is even worse in in these minority regions, and especially for the Uyghurs. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that today. Um, 
So just to give you a, a tiny bit more information on the work that I do in Washington, D.C., there's actually quite a, a large community of Uyghur people who have fled China and have uh, been granted political asylum in the United States. Um, and I work for an organization that um, is, is attached to this diaspora community in, in Washington, D.C. And the real focus of our work is to publicize human rights abuses in China. And the, the main way we do that is by writing in-depth reports about human rights abuses. So I'm going to talk you guys through a few of our major reports and kind of introduce you to the kind of issues that, uh, that we investigate and that we deal with in our reports. And the first report that I'm going to talk to you about, it's incidentally the first report that, uh, that I wrote with the organization, is about religious freedom. And I did bring copies of the reports that maybe we can pass them around as I talk about them. And I mean, I only brought one of each, but the lucky person can take them home too. And <laughs> actually, they're, they're all completely free and available on the internet. So if, if any of these reports sound like, oh, I'd really like to read that, um, go to our website, uhrp.org, and you can download the reports. And I'm certainly um, happy to tell you more and giving you more information about these reports. Um, so the first one, Sacred Right Defiled, is about religious freedom. And uh, freedom of religion is a, a major issue. Actually, maybe I'll send this around. Uh, it's a major issue for the Uyghur people because, uh, you know, as with many people in the world, religion is a central part of the Uyghur people's identity. Um, and religious freedom is a major issue across China. The, the Chinese government, as a, as a communist government, is officially atheist. Um, and there's, there's a tremendous amount of regulation specifically for people who are involved with the government. For example, no communist party members are allowed to enter a mosque. Um, but the, the rules that, that govern religion, specifically in the Uyghur region, uh, tend to be even harsher than in other parts of China. And I'd, I'd say that the, the harshest rule um, in my reading is that children under 18 are not allowed to enter the mosque. Um, so what, what, what that rule does, um, and it's beyond just entering a mosque actually. In China, religious education for Uyghur children is pretty much forbidden. And anyone who is caught um, teaching religious classes to their children uh, can be put in jail. And uh, this is, you know, religion everywhere in China is, is, is restricted, but this particular restriction is extremely severe because what it does is it prevents people from teaching religion to their children. I mean, it sends a message that this, uh, this part of your culture is, is basically not going to be passed on to the next generation. Um, and that is, is extremely scary for a lot of Uyghur people. Um, there's also, there's other, um, there's other uh, restrictions that also generally tend to, tend to target young people specifically. For example, um, many of you know that one of the central tenets of, of Islam is uh, fasting during the holy month of Ramadan. Uh, and that's also something the Chinese government has been extremely uh, focused on controlling, regulating, and even preventing, specifically for children, um, using the, the reason that, you know, if kids are fasting, you know, they won't be able to focus in school, whatever. I mean, the, the, there are some explanations given for uh, regulations that really prevent uh, Uyghur children from practicing their religion as their parents would. So some, some things might happen like um, at, at student dormitories, you know, before, before the fast begins at dawn, um, often students wake, wake up super early and eat before they start fasting. In, in schools in China, if you turn your light on before dawn, you'll get in trouble with the, with the administration at your school. Or 
we've there's even documentation of students being forced to eat at lunchtime during Ramadan. Um, so Ramadan has been one one religious uh, celebration that Chinese authorities have been extremely focused on restricting. Um, and specifically in the past, since 2013, since the new Chinese uh, president has come to power, Xi Jinping, there have been more and more uh, restrictions that have taken activities that, for the Uyghur people, religious activities that were once very normal, traditional, um, now have become illegal. Um, women are no longer allowed to cover in, in certain parts of the, of the region, including the capital city, Rumchi, has passed a citywide reg regulation that not only can women not cover their heads, men can't grow beards because a beard is seen as, a, as an outward sign of, of your religious faith. And um, that's being cracked down as well. Um, having an unlicensed religious book, such as a Quran, if, a, if the Quran isn't issued by the Chinese state, it's illegal. You can be put in prison for having it. Um, even getting married now without a state license is being considered a religious extremism practices that you know, traditionally are very normal for Uyghur people now, uh, have become illegal to the point where it's not even clear at some times to, to the Uyghurs what is legal and what isn't legal. Um, so religious repression is, is a major focus of um, our work of raising awareness about what's happening to the Uyghurs. I'm going to skip the next slide and go to the, this one, bilingual education. <laughs> Um, is another major uh, another major area where the Uyghur people feel their culture and identity is uh, being threatened by the Chinese state. And <coughs> pass this one around too. Um, bilingual education actually refers to an education system in the Uyghur region where instead of being educated in Uyghur language, they're educating. Uyghur children in Chinese. Um, so actually, bilingual education is a euphemism because it actually is referring to monolingual education in Chinese. So even though, as, as I mentioned, when, uh, when, the, when the Chinese Communist Party took over this region in 1949, they, practiced, they promised the Uyghurs that they would have freedom of, to speak their own language. Um, in reality, uh, that freedom has been gradually eroded um, I think it was 2003 when all of the university majors in the region took away all Uyghur language majors. So from, from that point on, all, all university education um, is in Chinese. At this point, um, even at the preschool level, Uyghur children are studying in Chinese. And it does create quite a few problems. I mean, not only is it uh, limiting the, the education that Uyghur people get in their mother tongue and kind of limiting their ability to develop the academic capacity in, in their mother tongue. Also, it prevents, it, it presents certain challenges because uh, the Uyghur language and the Chinese language are completely different. So it can be very difficult for Uyghur children to even uh, comprehend uh, course materials that are, that are taught to them, especially in elementary school in the Chinese language um, because of their, their mother tongue in, in Uyghur language. Um, and I, I, I don't know if you could see on this slide, but um, the, the Uyghur script, is, it's presented here, for example, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Uy Region uh, is written here in, in first the Uyghur script, second Chinese script, and third in, in, in the uh, Roman script, the Uyghur script is, is an Arabic script, um, so it's a phonetic script, but it's completely uh, different from Chinese language, which is written with characters that um, are not phonetic, they're uh, ideograms, so learning the, the two languages is a major challenge, um, and preserving the Uyghur language is a, a major part of preserving the Uyghur identity. So. Um, and to, to kind of illustrate how serious this issue is, 
Um, for example, a, a Uyghur man a few years ago had opened a, a Uyghur language kindergarten in the region, um, and he was subsequently arrested and put in prison. He was actually released on appeal uh, after he had spent, I think, almost two years in prison. Um, but his only crime was opening a, a, a kindergarten that educated Uyghur students in their mother tongue. Um, so it's an issue that's taken extremely seriously by the Chinese government. Uh, oh, thank you. Now I'm just going to have a sip of water. So another, another element of kind of the, the way China maintains control over this, uh, over this region is by strictly controlling the news and strictly controlling reporting on what's happening to the Uyghurs and what's happening in, in the region. And again, you've probably heard that free speech is extremely limited throughout China. That, uh, for example, the Chinese internet has uh, restrictions that limit people from accessing all kinds of websites that contain, contain information the Chinese government may consider to be sensitive or politically threatening. I mean, we're not just talking about some extremist websites. We're talking about <laughs> Google. We're talking about Facebook. Uh, they're all blocked in China. Um, so restricting information is a, is a central part of the way that the Chinese Communist Party uh, maintains its control in, in China. Um, and the Uyghur people are specifically targeted um, with these restrictions on free speech. And so this report, this was, this was a report that I was very excited to be working on because I, my own uh, professional background um, was working for a press freedom organization that worked on issues of censorship globally. Um, and so I was very interested in doing research on how China restricts free speech for the Uyghurs, and specifically f for the Uyghurs using the internet. Um, because at the Committee to Protect Journalists, when I, when I worked at that organization um, in 2009, Dozens of Uyghur web, webmasters uh, who, who ran websites were all put into prison. And uh, this was an issue that I, that I knew needed to be further investigated. So this report here um, is about freedom of information online. And it, on the cover, it has nine, uh, nine people who were all put into prison for either posting something online, uh, running a website, or some, uh, some activity uh, related to the internet. Um, so, you know, this is, this is really serious. This isn't just blocking Facebook. This isn't just saying you can't check your Facebook. This is um, people going to jail for, for running a website on which they um, talk about issues that are affecting their community. Um, and, the, the kind of watershed moment um, that, that really brought that issue to, to the public attention was in, in 2009, uh, the Chi after, after unrest in the region, the Chinese government actually shut down the internet entirely, the whole region, for 10 months. Um, and that's you know, pretty unprecedented. I mean, can you imagine what would happen to an economy uh, when there's, there's no internet, there's, there's no way to coordinate services, there's no way to send an email. Um, and in, in fact, it did have a, a huge economic impact on the region. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about that. Um, another, another case that I kind of wanted to share, I mean, it's not just Uyghur people um, who can't speak out. Also, foreign reporters have extremely limited access to the region. And even if a foreign reporter can get to the region, the local people are very scared to tell what's, ha what's happening because, um, because they could be arrested as a result. And even um, Uyghur people living here, living in the United States, for example, the, the U.S. funds a, a group called Radio Free Asia that does a ton of reporting on, um, on human rights issues in the Uyghur region. 
And their, their kind of star reporter found two years ago that two of his brothers were put into prison as a result of his reporting from the United States. Um, so even, even people who are completely outside of China um, can be silenced by the Chinese state if they're reporting on issues that China doesn't want people to know about. So I mean, part of the reason why the representative of uh, the Uyghur Human Rights Project talking to you today as an American is because many Uyghur people are extremely scared to share this information about what's happening in their homeland because if they do have family back in China, you know, they're vulnerable because of their family, because their family could be punished in reprisal for them sharing this information that the Chinese government considers to be extremely threatening. Um, the final report, let me just check in on time. Uh, the final report that I'm going to talk about today is uh, about repression as anti-terrorism. So basically, because um, because the Uyghur people are Muslim, since 9-11, the Chinese government has leveled the accusation of terrorism against the Uyghurs, basically in any case when uh, Uyghur people have either spoken out about human rights issues or um, any, any, anything. I mean, the, the label of separate, of terrorism um, has been leveled against the Uyghurs time and again. Um, and because it's happening in this infor information vacuum, um, no one really knows uh, when the Chinese government says that an incident has, has, uh, has taken place, um, whether, what, it, what it means that China is calling the incident terrorist. Um, and in this context, um, in which the Uyghur people have faced extreme repression, uh, heavy restrictions on their, their religion, heavy restrictions on their ability to, to write and to speak, there have been, specifically since the new Chinese president came to power, a large number of violent incidents have broken out in the Uyghur homeland. Um, so this report that I have here called Legitimizing Repression is just about incidents that took place in the years of 2013 to 2014, the first two years of the Chinese president's presidency. Uh, we found 150 incidents took place in the Uyghur region at that time um, based on re media reports, mostly from Radio Free Asia, again, that, that news service that um, is based in the United States um, has done great reporting. Of these 150 incidents, only 30% were actually reported on in, in Chinese media. Um, so most of these were covered up. Most of these were labeled as terrorism, but if you dig a little deeper, we found in most of those cases, it was actually, I mean, often what, what, what triggered these incidents were um, police enforcing a rule. For example, the police would walk into someone's home and take a, take a woman's uh, head covering off and a, a scuffle would, would result. Um, in, in these total 150 incidents, we found about 700 people were killed. Um, so this is real violence. Um, and uh, what we know about it is just it's extremely limited because of all these restrictions on free information. But what we do know is that there is no coordinated Uyghur terrorist movement. I mean, in this context where you know Uyghur people can't even access the internet, that idea of um, Uyghur people kind of coordinating something like terrorism um, it's simply not possible. Um, but we also know that as Uyghur people find themselves in this increasingly repressive environment, um, there's, there's no stopping these skirmishes and these violent incidents from continuing to happen. Um, and while, while there's no you know, kind of coordinated movement, I mean, certainly people who are being oppressed may May even plan, uh, may even plan, kind of attacks. Um, so, I guess the the takeaway there is that because China uses this label of terrorism to basically single out anything the Uyghurs do, um, 
that challenges Chinese rule and even Chinese repression, um, it's extremely difficult to know um, what 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 is really going on with with incidents that we read about in the news here. Um, so next, uh, this is we're almost at the end of my my presentation. I do want to leave some time for Q and A, um, so I'm just going to go over a few dates to, to end my presentation. Um, one, I just put June 4th, 1989 on there because I think people probably know about the Tiananmen Square massacre in which you know, basically like a million students had assemble, assembled in Tiananmen Square. These are not Uyghur students, although actually the, the second most famous leader from this Tiananmen Square incident was a Uyghur um, because Uyghur people, there are Uyghurs in Beijing also. Um, but I, I, I included that because I wanted, I wanted to remind everyone that um, human rights are not just something that the Uyghur people want, it's something that all Chinese people want. And 1989 was a real turning point for human rights in China because uh, the 80s was a, a little bit more open. Um, but after the, the students called for freedom in Tiananmen Square in 1989, and there was this harsh crackdown, hundreds or even thousands were killed. Um, it kind of ushered in a period in the 90s that was extremely repressive. And after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, where all of these countries bordering uh, the Uyghur region um, kind of became independent from the Soviet Union, China started getting really scared. And the 90s were a very repressive time for the Uyghurs. Uh, 1997, uh, in, in February of 1997, uh, there was a, a big incident in Hulja, which is a Uyghur city. Actually, so the, the 1989 Tiananmen Square was over in Beijing. And February 5th, 1997, the border of Kazakhstan, a city called Hulja, the Uyghur people were uh, basically protesting after the Chinese government crackdown on informal religious gatherings. So these, these gatherings were, in, in, in the 90s, there was also actually a, a big heroin epidemic in, in, in the region affecting Uyghurs. And to combat that, Uyghur people kind of joined together in these religious groups to kind of fight alcoholism and fight drug abuse in their community. Um, on February 5th, 1997, after the Chinese government banned these, uh, these religious groups, um, which the Uyghur people were using to, to kind of uh, mobilize their community, um, Uyghurs protested. And those, that, that protest was very violently suppressed. So 1997 is a major date for Uyghur people because it's one of the first uh, big incidents in which China uh, very violently suppressed Uyghurs' attempts to uh, defend their human rights. Um, and the other big one is 2009. Um, and so I mentioned before that after unrest in 2009, the government shut down the internet in the region for 10 months. So what happened in 2009 is first, uh, on June 25th, in a toy factory in the Pearl River Delta, so that's over here by Hong Kong, this is the region where you know most of our made in China products come from. Um, so at a toy factory, and you know this is actually very very far from East Turkestan. Uh, in 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 the past uh, 10, 15 years, China has made more of an effort to bring Uyghur people into mainland China. Kind of also part of the uh, attempts to uh, you know make them part of of China. Um, so there were quite a few Uyghur workers at a at a toy factory. And you know the factory conditions here are very very poor. Um, people they have hard lives, and basically, in this factory, some Han Chinese workers again that's the the predominant ethnic group in China accuse some Uyghur workers of raping another worker, and then a mob basically came and murdered these Uyghur men who had been accused of this rape. Um, so it was a very violent incident and. Uh, several Uyghurs were murdered in this factory. Um, and several days later, uh, Uyghur people back in Urumqi, 
um, you know, so other side of the country organized demonstrations to say, why did this happen? Why is there no justice? Why were our you know, fellow Uyghurs sent across the country and then murdered? Um, because uh, they wanted answers. They wanted to know what happened. And those demonstrations on July 5th were extremely violently suppressed, again, because of um, restrictions on information, and specifically in this case, because the government shut down the internet for 10 months after it happened. Um, we don't know exactly how many people were imprisoned and how many people were killed, but uh, there, there's been plenty of documentation of, of people being shot by the police in, in those demonstrations. and. Um, Many, many, uh, especially young men, uh, were killed in that incident. And I mean, most recently, there was a mother whose son basically just disappeared after after the July 5th in incident, who ever since then, you know, now we're at 2016, she's been saying publicly, where's my son? And she's spoken to news media. And she was recently just sentenced um, for revealing state secrets, and her only crime is that she's been looking for her son since he's in prison July 5th, 2009. Um, so 2009 is a, a pretty major uh, watershed moment for the Uyghur people because uh, at that time there was this massive unrest and um, afterwards the internet was shut down. Basically everyone who ran a website was put in prison and um, hundreds if not thousands of young Uyghur people were, were also rounded up. Um, and the final slide that I have for you is a Uyghur scholar, Professor Ilham Tohti. Um, and Professor Ilham Tohti actually also ran a website um, and he is, he is a political prisoner. He was in prison in January 2014. And Professor Ilham Tohti is a little different. Um, his website is a little different than the webs, the most of the websites that were shut down in two thousand nine, because he worked in Chinese. He he made a website in Chinese, and the focus of his work is to build bridges between the Uyghur people and the Han Chinese people, because, as I've said throughout this presentation, you know all Chinese people have have to deal with the restrictions that the Chinese Communist Party enforces. Um, and Ilham Tohti recognized that friendship between the Han Chinese and the Uyghur people is really the only way that conditions in his homeland could improve. Um, so Ilham Tohti, uh, he was a, a professor at the, the Nationalities University in Beijing, and his, his, his life work was to focus on connecting Chinese and, and Uyghurs. And so in January tw 2014, um, when he was imprisoned, uh, it was it was a very devastating blow for the Uyghur human rights movement. And not only was he imprisoned, seven of his young students who worked on his website were also thrown in jail. Um, and Ilham Tohti was given an unusually harsh sentence. Uh, at at the time, uh, President Xi Jinping, the the new president of China, had has been cracking down on all kinds of uh, Chinese human rights lawyers and activists. But the sentence that was given to Ilham Tohti was much harsher than, uh, than what most of these human rights activists have been given. So he's actually sentenced to life in prison, um, again, for the, for the crime of running a website. The only evidence used against him is his website and lectures that he gave publicly at this college. Um, so. Ilham Tohti has become a, a major focus, not only for my organization, but for all kinds of human rights group. Um, Pan American Center, which is an organization of uh, writers to support uh, freedom of, of expression, and spe spe specifically the freedom to write, gave him a, a big award in 2014 after he's imprisoned, which uh, was actually accepted in absentia by his daughter because uh, he was actually getting on a flight the year before he was imprisoned uh, to come teach at Indiana University in 2013. And he was bringing his 19-year-old daughter with him. 
at that time, he was actually detained at the airport, but they let his daughter through. So Ilham Tohti's daughter is, has been in Indiana ever since then. Just imagine this 19-year-old girl, she got there in 2013. The next year, her father was uh, imprisoned, then, then sentenced to a life imprisonment. Um, so uh, this, this young woman has, has been through a lot. She's actually recently put out an autobiography kind of detailing her experience um, and, and, and the struggle of her family. But I just wanted to share this case. I mean, this case also is, is unique because it brings, uh, it unites the work that the, the Uyghur human rights community is doing with the work of kind of broader Chinese human rights activists, you know, people that came out of that Tiananmen incident um, and have been fighting for freedom in China generally. I mean, everybody's kind of on board fighting for Ilham Tohti. And um, I've shared this, this hashtag, hashtag free Ilham. So um, that's, that's just one tool that the, the international rights community is using to raise awareness and, and keep Ilham Tohti in the news because we don't want to forget about this man. I mean, he's, um, we, any pressure that can be put on the Chinese government to release Ilham Tohti, um, that is a, a foremost concern and priority in our movement. Um, so now I'm going to open it up to Q&A. Please, any questions you have, I know that's a, a lot that we covered. and. Um, Yes. Uh, the question is whether the, the oppression of the Uyghur people has been brought before the United Nations. I mean, the answer is definitely yes. Um, and uh, I mean, certainly the Uyghurs are not alone in um, being a stateless indigenous population that is uh, being oppressed today, you know. Uh, so the United Nations has um, has many mechanisms to defend human rights. For example, um, there's uh, there's commitments that countries sign not to torture, um, and the United Nations will review um, will review those commitments uh, periodically. So actually, last year, China was uh, before a United Nations panel to. Um, to defend, to, to explain its, its, um, its record on torture and on its obligations under the International Convention Against Torture, which, which it's a signatory to. Um, and at those, at those times, Uyghur issues will always come up. I mean, torture specifically, there's plenty of documentation of Uyghurs being tortured, especially after that 1997 incident. Um, in these United Nations forums, the Chinese diplomats will harass the Uyghur uh, representatives, um, and it, it's very embarrassing. I mean, this this recent this recent news news story that had the Queen of England kind of commentate commenting that she had this interaction or one of her admirals had an interaction with the Chinese uh, diplomats and said they're very rude. Um, that that rudeness is something that um, in international fora the the. Weaver rec representatives have been consistently like asked to leave meetings by the Chinese delegates, and the UN has always, you know, been very supportive of of Uyghur, uh, Uyghur groups that are are you know very legitimately part of of these meetings. Um, so the United Nations, it's a it's a very complicated system, um, and. At the end of the day, it's it's very difficult to enforce all of the obligations China has to its people um, through through various treaty bodies. Um, but um, the United Nations is really some one one mechanism by which the Uyghur people hope uh, to to improve the human rights situation in in their homeland in East Turkestan. Thank you for that question. Um, are the Uyghurs at all like the Kurds in that, um, are they, is, is this a, a China problem or is it a, a, a multi-dimensional problem? Do they have, are they persecuting Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, any of the other countries where they, they may not be uh, a minority or is this strictly just in China where they're, where they're being persecuted? It's a great question. So the question is whether Uyghurs are persecuted in other, other countries as they are in China. Um, 
the answer to that question, uh, I think more and more the Uyghur people are being persecuted in other countries, specifically um, Uyghur people trying to flee human rights abuses in China are having a harder time um, ha having a harder time finding safe haven. Um, so 20 years ago when we were people tried to flee China, they would they would flee through Central Asia. And even when uh, the U United Nations rep recognized uh, we were people who had fled as refugees, um, there were cases when Central Asian countries would deport them to China and in spite of their their pr <laughs> protection as as refugees um, and because China has asserted more and more influence over those Central Asian countries I mean 20 30 years ago there was there was actually quite a bit of uh, activism Uyghur activism in those countries now it's not it's not the same it's not really um, possible for Uyghurs to to speak out in those countries because Chinese uh, influence in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan is is much greater now than it was um, than it was in the past. Um, Uyghur people have found new routes to 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 flee, um, and those routes uh, actually they track with the same uh, paths that other Chinese people have have fled through South, South Southeast Asia through Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, but. Again, growing Chinese influence has resulted in uh, increasing deportations from those countries as well. Um, so um, most recently, I think it's two years ago, there were 300, three, 300 Uyghur people had fled um, and they were found in the possession of human smugglers in Thailand. I mean, they, they were willingly in the possession of these smugglers because that's how the, they, they were escaping China. Um, and basically the Thai government uh, put all of these um, Uyghurs fleeing China into, into detention facilities, trying to figure out what to do with them. Um, and about a year later, roughly half the group was allowed to, to go to Turkey. And Turkey has actually offered safe haven to to many, many Uyghur refugees um, and asylum seekers um, because there is a cultural connection between Turkey and, and the Uyghurs. Um, but unfortunately, the other half of that group were later deported back to China. Um, so, you know, they had left because they're fleeing human rights abuses um, and they were sent back um, and it was widely condemned um, by the UN, by by, by pretty much everyone, by the by the State Department, um, because being sent back to China, they they face certain persecution, if not torture, if not execution. Um, so the the situation for Uyghurs internationally has certainly um, become more difficult, especially as China's influence has grown. Yeah, in no means do I want to defend the Chinese government. You always ask yourself, what in the world are these guys thinking? And I had a chance to meet some of them last year when we were at the various House of Talk. And if they, you actually said, what if there's no religion tomorrow in the world, they would say there's a lot less fewer wars, there's Shiites, Sunnis, nothing going on. And they're very happy that we're involved in the Middle East and not them. This time, again, not defending them at all, saying, what are they thinking? And the other thing to just ask yourself, too, is if in our intercommunal sector. So Tiananmen Square has succeeded. You sit there and you think, what would it look like the day after? And we're all sitting there saying, what if Tiananmen Square succeeds on the other side? But what happens then with all these ethnic groups and everybody fighting for power, much like Yugoslavia, much like everybody fighting each other? You just ask yourself, what's the day after? When Saddam Hussein's gone, when uh, Assad is having trouble, you know, what's it look like after? You just ask yourself that. Now, I'm not defending either side. I'm not taking the other side and saying, what are these guys thinking about? And why are they doing what they're doing? Sure. I mean, I'd, I'd say that, you know, throughout this presentation, I'm not I'm not here to say, you know, Uyghur people should not be part of China or they should be independent. Um, that's a word that, you know, it's not productive, especially for, from from my perspective. I mean, what we, what we try to do with, at our organization is raise awareness about 
um, clear human rights abuses, um, which don't benefit China. Don't, they don't benefit anyone. I mean, taking away people's freedom of religion and freedom of speech in the long run um, has very negative repercussions for, for the country itself. And I mean, I think that, um, yeah, your, your question, what are, they, what are they really thinking, is a really good one because um, the, the, these repressive policies, I think, are definitely short-sighted and in the end will create more problems in the region. Um, the professor Ilham Tokti is, uh, he's had very few family visits since he was uh, at f first imprisoned, um, in January 2014. I mean, when he was very first imprisoned, he was, he was kept in shackles, I think, for 60 days. There was the one point where he was denied food for a certain amount of time. Um, his his uh, as as I mentioned, his daughter is here. His fam, the rest of his family, his wife, and uh, he has a son. They're still in Beijing, but they're really struggling because now she can't. She has no income. All his assets were frozen. Um, having the international attention that there is on his case is extremely important because it will prevent anything from happening to him, I mean, in terms of his health and safety, as long as the international community is watching, uh, it's, he, he's, he's safe, but um, he doesn't enjoy regular visits with his family. Certainly the conditions in which he's held, I think, are, are probably very poor. I mean, I myself am very lucky because I am, I don't have any family in China. I mean, I, I studied quite a bit in China and I, I did a 10-month research project in China. Um, and when I started this job, um, I, I came, I've been working for the Uyghur Human Rights Project since 2012. I basically cut off contact with everyone in China simply out of fear that you know, any contact with me might have negative consequences for them. I mean, I, I would be very, I would be very scared myself to go back to China at this point. Um, but it's even worse for my colleagues, most of whom are Uyghur. I mean, most of the people who are active in the community come from families that basically have nothing left to lose. Um, and for, for the community generally, I mean, there is a lot of fear that they're being watched and that the, the, the more they speak out, um, that their families back home could, could suffer as a result. Thanks for your question. Is there any regional governance? What does it look like if there is? So uh, I didn't talk much about this, but beginning in 1955, there was actually a, a system of regional autonomy put in place. Um, so, oh, do you, do you mean regionally as in, uh, in, in... Political or, uh, you know, leadership, uh, economic or political issues? Well, how's it run? It's all run by, by the Chinese Communist Party, which is a very non-transparent organization. Um, I mean, there's, because, so it's a, it's a, uh, nominally, it's an autonomous region in which the Uyghur people have uh, political autonomy, freedom to, uh, you know, to enjoy um, certain cultural protections that in other parts of China, it's not, it's not administered the same way as a regular Chinese province. Um, but, but in reality, all of the kind of top positions in the region are not, don't belong to Uyghurs, they belong to Han Chinese. Um, the, the party secretary of the region, Han Chinese. Um, so all, all real power and decision making is, is in the hands of the Chinese. Um, but, you know, part of, part of communism is to have a lot of committees and associations. Everything is regulated. So even, even the mosque is, 
is regulated by a, a Chinese agency, the China Islamic Association. Um, so uh, really every aspect of life in the region um, is, uh, is regulated in some way or another by, by the Chinese uh, Communist Party. And uh, I think what's a little bit m more restrictive in, in, in the Uyghur region than other ch parts of China is uh, restrictions on mobility. So it's very difficult uh, for people to travel, um, even within the region, people have to have uh, more certification than, than they need uh, in other parts of China. Yeah, thank you for your question. One more. Do the Uyghur people want independence, or they, do they just want to change their current situation? That's a great question. Unfortunately, the Uyghur people don't really get an opportunity to answer that question. So, I mean, if you put 10 Uyghur people in a room, their answer to your question, whether they want independence, I, I think all 10 of them will have something different to say. I mean, in this situation in which uh, free speech is so limited, there's really no knowing what the Uyghur people want um, because nobody is asking them. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to speak with you after, after the talk. Thank you all. And I have a gift for you. Oh, thank um, you. A novel by um, O.K. Undibi, who is one of our former speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And uh, keep, a, keep an eye out for our upcoming program. Bye-bye.